Olling, uh, who will tell you something about storytelling. And um, he is a, used to be a BBC uh, TV presenter, uh, news journalist, actually. And also, uh, he wrote a book on storytelling. So uh, it's called uh, Be Creative Now. Uh, and uh, good morning and hello, Steve. Hello. Thanks, Yasin. Shall, shall I go straight off? Yes, um, maybe so, just a little bit of housekeeping before we start. Um, so, uh, if you want to um, ask Steve any questions, you can do that by using the questions box uh, on the right hand side. And uh, I will um, turn off my camera so we can focus on Steve and his content. And um, then uh, I will read them out loud when, Steve, you're ready to take some questions. Okay, fantastic. Thank you, Yasna. Um, so, first thing is that this uh, this session is about how to tell great stories about your work. And what I should say is that uh, I've preloaded some of the slides onto Twitter. So, at various points during the next sort of forty-five minutes, uh, some of these will come up. Uh, my Twitter account is at Steve Rawling, um, and I'll not only tweet some of the slides from today's presentation, but at the end of the session, I'll tweet links that will take you to the whole slide deck. Um, and also to some, some useful reading, which if you want to take this, this, this study further, there's some really great books out there, um, which you can have a look at about, about storytelling. And we're talking about storytelling specifically about your business, your work. Because what I want you to be able to do at the end of this session is to think about how do you tell great stories about your work. Uh, so it's not just telling great stories down the, down the pub or in the cafe to entertain people. These are stories about, about business, about work. So what we're going to cover today um, are why stories are the best way to get your message across. We'll also look at what are the basic ingredients of a good story that you can use for work. We'll talk about different types of stories you can tell or you can use at work. And we'll also get you started now and think about something you can do straight away where you can actually start to think about how do you use stories in your work. Now, I want to start off with a question, and the question is, why do smart people talk such rubbish when they talk about their work? Now, as a journalist, I used to come across this all the time. Um, and I, you talk to people about business and the thing they, that they were really passionate, and they were talking to you as a journalist because they wanted to get their, their story across, and yet they talk in such incredibly impenetrable language. And I, I started to wonder whether some people actually suffered from something called microphobia. And that's a word I've made up. Um, and a microphobia is essentially a noun, an extreme or irrational fear of a live microphone. Because when some people get a live microphone in their hand, uh, they just seem to go to pieces and start using language that you would never normally use. To give you an example. The, uh, there was a lady I met at a conference last year, and she was pitching an idea for a business, and she was pitching to investors, and the pitch didn't go very well. She was very, very nervous. Um, and afterwards, I, I chatted to her and said, well, you know, what, what is this, this business that you're, you're doing? And it turned out that she was working on a product that could operate, that could help women, working uh, in, on an idea that could help women in cities like Delhi uh, in India. And cities like Delhi, it's very hard for women to travel alone on public transport. In fact, it's been estimated that 80% of women traveling alone on public transport in India, in Indian cities, have been subjected to abuse at some point, either verbal abuse or harassment or sexual abuse. And this woman wanted to change that, and she wanted to come up with a, a product which would be like a kind of connected device, an Internet of Things meets, meets rape alarm, that would allow women very cheap, very, very cheaply to, to raise their concerns, to flag up a problem if they were traveling alone and felt vulnerable. And she said it mattered to her because she'd grown up in the city and she knew what it felt like. She'd come to London and then realized, hang on a second, I don't need a chaperone when I'm traveling around. This is not right. I need to do something about it. So much so that she'd given up a really well-paid job to start a tech company, even though actually she wasn't a technician. She wasn't a technical person. So I thought, wow, that's fantastic. And I said, can I interview you? And so I got out my microphone and I started the interview and I said, so tell me, why did you give up this really well-paid job to start your own company? And she said, it was such a good, such a great value proposition. And she started talking in this kind of language. It was a great value proposition. The user case was so strong. 
And I thought, hang on a second, what are you talking about? Tell me the story about the women you're trying to help. Tell me the story about your outrage. Tell me the story about this, this thing you're trying to solve. And she couldn't. She just kept talking in this terrible, terrible business language. And it was very, very hard to get the real story out of her because I think a lot of people, when they feel they have to speak formally in front of a live microphone, feel they have to use formal business language. And you don't. In fact, if you do, people just switch off. Now, my advice to her was go and find a sixth form college and go and talk to the girls in the sixth form college about having a career in technology. And to be honest, if you can face 16 and 17 year olds and talk to them, nothing else will be scary after that. But the point was that the look on people's face is when people start to use this language, it's like this, we're baffled, we're confused, we're bored, we're, 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 we just don't get it when people start talking. And it leaves you to wonder, well, why don't people listen when I talk about my work? And if this is you thinking, why don't people listen when I talk about my work, then you need to think about story. And this is the reason why. What you have to accept is that first you have to realize that everyone you talk to is already drowning in a sea of words. It's been estimated we're exposed to 100,000 words every day. If you think about that, this is like someone starts talking to you when you wake up in the morning and doesn't stop till tea time. So it's hardly surprising we deal with this by blocking most of the words around us out. So quite simply, we just don't listen to most of the words around us. When you add to that, this phenomena. Now, you may have seen this photograph on uh, Twitter a couple of years ago. This is basically a, it's a horse that's got stuck in a fence, but it's also been photobombed by a cow. Um, and this went viral. Everyone was looking at it. Everyone was laughing. Everyone was, was reversioning it, making memes. The Huffington Post's headline that day was, cow photobombs horse, we can all go home now. So what the Huffington, Huffington Post was saying is, as journalists, we know that you're not going to be talking about anything we write today. You're just going to be sharing this picture because it's funny. So this is the world we're in. It's a very noisy world. It's a very busy world. There's lots of distractions out there. So if you want your message, your story to grab attention, you need to go for what's in the front of people's minds. I'll explain what I mean by that in a moment. But there are, there are four ways you can try to get your message to lodge in the front of people's minds. So, for example, you can make your message timely. You can make it re relatable. You can make it unexpected. And you can make it emotionally engaging. Above all, of course, you have to make it true. Uh, whatever you've uh, heard in the last few months, we are not living in a, any kind of post-truth age. If you're talking and you won't have any credibility, then what you say has got to be based in facts. But facts on their own are not enough. So let's just go through those one by one, and I'll, show, I'll tell you what I mean by them. So first of all, let's talk about something that's timely. So I assume the, word, the message you want to get across is important, but you've got to tell me not just why, but why now. So why is this important? Why is it important now? So I'll give you an example. If I was wanting to talk about a course in public speaking, then I could talk to you about the ancient Greeks, the orators, the sophists, the Romans, the, the, the likes of the, the people who wrote the rules of, of public speaking. I could talk to you about them. Or I could ask you why Make America Great Again was such a great election slogan for Donald Trump. Now, if I'm asking you to think about ancient Greek and ancient Roman history, I'm asking you to dig deep into your memory banks to try and make sense of what I'm saying. Whereas Donald Trump, is very timely. He's unavoidably right here and right now. So which am I gonna use when I want to talk about public speaking? Clearly I'm gonna talk about the thing that's timely. This is important, why and why now? In newsrooms, we used to talk about something called a peg. And a peg is literally like a, like a, a coat peg. This is something timely to hang your story on. So, Journalists will often turn down a good story in favour of a good story that has a timely peg. And the peg is simply, why do we do this story now? The kind of things which provide you pegs are things which are in the news right now, things which are trending, so things which are popular with your audience right now, or things that are seasonal. So you know, at the beginning of January, everyone is actually dimly aware that they've made a New Year's resolution they should stick to. 
this time of year everyone's thinking about spring and the changing of the seasons uh, or they're thinking in the UK right now they're thinking about the snap election so whatever it is that's, that's, that's current newsy trending or seasonal can give you a timely peg for the thing you want to say you also need to make your message relatable and relatable simply means are you talking in terms of, of something that I can make sense of let's just do a little test I want you to picture in your head an area of the, the surface of the planet and that area is 2.07 million hectares in size can anybody genuinely think how big that is is that massive is that a continent is that sort of quite small how big is 2.07 million hectares it's very hard to tell what if I told you it is an area the size of Wales now for UK audiences this is very very relatable for European audience it probably is too because we often look at maps we look at weather maps we look at road maps and we see the outline of countries and particularly in the UK we see that bit of Wales just sort of sticking out of the side so we've made sense of something by relating it to something we can all understand there are several ways you can look at relatable so how could your message relate to an everyday object how could it relate to a familiar process something that we all do how could it relate to a human relationship like a family relationship so if you're trying to talk to people about a complex particularly a complex subject you have to find a way of making it relatable to one of these things something they go oh yes I get that so I was talking I'll give you an example I was talking a few weeks ago to a scientific researcher who was trying to make a, uh, a breathing mask for cyclists that could filter out nanoparticles uh, so diesel particles that kind of thing um, and eventually he, we got down to well how big is a nanoparticle and he described it in terms of it's a hundred times smaller than a human hair well actually we've all got hair well most of us have got hair um, so you could relate to something being a hundred times smaller than a human hair but you couldn't relate to it given its scientific term so relatable is really is really straight a, a great way to get people to focus on what you're saying now we come to unexpected and how does unexpected help you when you're trying to get your message across so what I want you to do is to listen to this sentence so this sentence I'm going to read to you now about the earth and it goes like this the earth revolves around the trouble once a year now within about two hundredths of a second of registering the word trouble your brain spotted that that didn't fit and it lit up a different part of your brain to the part of the brain that processed the information about the earth so the fact is that anomalies grab our attention and there's a good evolutionary reason for this in the past when we were trying to work our way through any kind of situation anything that was unusual anomaly unexpected was worth paying attention to because it might be a threat uh, so that still applies today we are still our attention is grabbed by things we're not expecting I'll give you another example I was walking through the tube in London the underground um, a couple of years ago and one thing I love about the underground is how you get all these posters and you see these fantastic uh, adverts everywhere for all these different things theatre shows and products and films and, and it's just a lovely you know distracting thing from the day but normally you just kind of walk past them you don't really take them in and one day I was walking through and I saw these posters for a fashion fashion company if you just read them they, the first one says wear green but the woman is wearing red the second one says prints are back but she's wearing a plain frock uh, blouse then it says polka dots are in but she's wearing a checked coat and finally go floral but she's not wearing any any kind of floral print clothing so there's something going on with this that the the words don't match the pictures in fact the picture telling you one thing the words are telling you another and it's so unexpected that it grabs your attention and the fashion brand jigsaw in this case the fashion brand behind this campaign they wanted to do this deliberately because what they were saying is our fashion is for people who don't follow trends our fashion is for people who set their own trend so that was the message they wanted to get across but by doing it like this they really truly grabbed our attention because it was unexpected so when you're thinking about your message the message you want to, to tell to people it's worth thinking about what is my audience expecting to hear 
What do they already think is true? And then how can I surprise them? What can I tell them they're not expecting? Obviously, you still have to be true to the facts, but how can you give them a fact they're not expecting? Because that will grab their attention. And then finally in this section, we come on to the emotionally engaging part of a message. Now, it doesn't mean you have to burst into tears like an Oscar-winning actress, but all you find is if you show some emotion and you allow me to tune my kind of emotional radar into what you're talking about. So if you tell me why you care about something, that helps me to focus on why I might care about it as well. So emotion is really, really important. And the great thing about stories is that they, stories combine facts, figures, and details with emotions, colors, and imagery. Now in that old left brain, right brain idea of, of how we process information, facts, figures, and details are on one side, emotions and colors and imagery and visuals are on the other side. So if what you're telling me gives me both those things together, then it's much more likely to make, this, to make the information memorable. And this is a, a, from William Arruda, who's written a, a foreword to a book called Storytelling About Your Brand. But I think Maya Angelou says it more eloquently. Uh, the no novelist Maya Angelou says, people will forget what you said, people will forget what you did, but people will never forget how you made them feel. So if you can tap into the emotional content of the message, how does it make you feel? I will start to identify with that and I'm much more likely to remember what you're saying if it comes with emotion. So just to recap, if you want to talk about your work so people listen, you need to think timely, relatable, unexpected and emotionally engaging. So timely, what's the peg to hang your message on? Why does it matter? Why does it matter now? How can you relate what you're saying to familiar objects, to familiar people, to familiar processes, to something everybody does or, or, or understands? What does your audience think or know already? And how can you surprise them? And then finally, in terms of emotionally engaging, can you tell it like a story? Why do you care? And don't ask me to care until you've told me why you care. And that's where stories really come in. That last part particularly is where stories are particularly strong because they, they come loaded with emotion. But let's just look at a little bit more as to why we tell stories and why stories work and why you need to learn to tell stories about your work. There's a great uh, experiment that was done back in the 1970s. It was called the Linda Problem. And there's two researchers called Daniel Kahneman and Amos Tversky. Um, and they came up with this, this, this test and they were absolutely amazed how many people failed it. The, the failure rate was around 85%, um, and they were really surprised by this. And I think this test says a lot about our relationship to stories. So I'm going to run it through with you. I normally do this in a classroom, so I get people to put their hands up. So I'm just going to trust you to, to, to you know, you're, you'll make the, the choice, and I'll trust that you are putting your hands up. So this is the Linda problem. What I want you to do is to picture a woman called Linda and have a picture in your mind as I'm describing Linda to you. So, Linda is 31 years old. She's single, outspoken, and very bright. She majored in philosophy. As a student, she was deeply concerned with discrimination and social justice. She also participated in anti-nuclear demos. So, have you got a picture of Linda in your mind now? Because I, I want you to answer a question. Which do you think is more probable? Is it A, Linda works in a call center, or B, Linda works in a call center and is an active feminist blogger? So, close your eyes, think of Linda, put your hand up for A, put your hand up for B. And I'm trusting you putting your hands up. Okay, now, 85% of people who've done this test put their hand up for B. They thought that Linda works in a call center and is an active feminist blogger. So let's just look at the, the maths behind this. So if you imagine that this pool here is all adult women, let's take the UK as an example, all adult women in, in the UK, and let's say this number of them are women working in call centres, it's a very popular occupation. And let's say this number of them are the women who are active 
feminist bloggers. It's probably a bit less popular than working in a call centre. And this group here, these are the women who are working in call centres and also active feminist bloggers. So if you put your hand up for B, then you are betting that Linda is in this group rather than A, which is this group. Now, when you look at it written in these terms, you realize that actually B is a long shot. A is much more likely than B because it's always much more likely for something to be one thing than it is to be one thing and another thing. It's just, it's just simple maths. It's much, much more likely to be A than A and B. The reason why so many people think B is because they've told a story about Linda. They imagined this feisty young woman who's gone through university on anti-nuclear demonstrations and they don't want Linda to finish up just working in a call centre. They don't, that's not a happy ending. The happy ending is Linda's working in the call centre but she's also a feminist blogger because that would be more in keeping with the Linda we knew. So we've projected a story onto it and that story has actually caused us to choose the most unlikely of the two options. So the story has beaten the logic in this case. There's another great example, this is from even earlier, this is an experiment done in 1944 and this what you can see on the screen in front of you now uh, was a, an animation created by Fritz Heider and Marianne Simmel uh, and they asked people to watch these shapes move on the screen and to, to work out what was going on and to, to sort of describe what was happening on the screen as they could see. And as people were watching they were saying oh well things like oh, the big triangle wanted to get out of that, that, that room. And his friends came, oh no, we're, we're, the big triangle is being a bit of a bully um, and the big triangle is chasing them around and the big triangle is aggressive and, and someone said, I think the small triangle's had an affair with the circle and the big triangle's found out and, and now the big triangle's trying to break into the, the house and, and it's like a home invasion. Um, and what are, what's happening here is basically people are projecting again, they're projecting a story, but this time they're projecting a story onto two-dimensional objects that are moving around the screen. It's as simple as that, but people love to see these things and project a story on them. This comes to um, a very interesting uh, quote from a guy called Nicholas Nassim Taleb, the author of The Black Swan, and he said, we have a limited ability to look at a sequence of facts without weaving an explanation into them. And he described this as the narrative fallacy. Quite simply, we like to think the world makes sense told as a story. Um, so that's why stories are very powerful. They're on your side. You're, you're working with a natural inclination that we like to think the world can be told like a story. That's why you need to use stories. So let's look at the basic ingredients of what you put into a story. Um, and particularly a story that is related to work. Now I'm going to tell you a story about myself as a young journalist. Um, and every young journalist who starts out is terrified of something called the death knock. And the death knock is where you have to knock on the door of someone whose family member has died in newsworthy circumstances. Um, and the first time I was asked to do a death knock, I said, I, I can't do it. I, I don't know how to do it. I, I don't know what to say. Um, and someone else had to do it. And then subsequent times, that they were very hard to do, but gradually you did more and more of them. They got a bit easier. About 15 years ago, I, I was asked to work on the, the trial and then public inquiry into uh, Harold Shipman, who was a serial killer. He was a, a doctor in the UK who killed over 200 of his patients. And so, not so you can imagine, by the time I finished working on that story, I'd done a lot of death knocks. What I realized was that people actually in that situation often did want to talk to somebody um, and I could say to them this is your chance to give your side of the story um, and that meant that I was being honest and fair with them and they might talk to me and, and often it did work. So that's the kind of basic and that's a, a basic story. Let's just break that down into its ingredients. So the first ingredient of a good story is that stuff happens. So stories have people, action, place and time. They have who, what, where and when. They tend to have a beginning, a middle and an end. They work in a kind of sequence. All of these things are things that mission statements and value statements and strategic policy documents don't have, but stories do. Stories are, you can, you can tell when you've heard a story because people say things like, oh, last week, or when I was a young journalist in that case, or I met this woman, 
uh, or and then and after that and eventually so these things indicate that stuff is happening so that's the first basic ingredient of a good story the second basic ingredient is that people care so this is the how of a story how did you feel so are you happy or sad are you ashamed or proud are you frustrated or relieved uh, are you angry or vindicated there's all sorts of emotions at play what you're listening for when you're listening for a story is people say oh we all felt or I was so and they tell you how they felt and usually if stuff has happened and people care about it you you've got a story but what makes it useful as a business story is that it has a moral. In other words, why does this matter? So it's not just enough that stuff happened and people care, you need to use it to explain why it matters. So we're talking about lessons learned, we're talking about the action you want to take as a result. So in my case, with the death knock, the lesson I learned was that people want to tell their story, they'll talk to me because they need to explain themselves to somebody, um, and I can justify doing quite a difficult thing by remembering that so that's the lesson I learned from that so the kind of things people say when they're talking about this is well I realized or and so now or since then so all those are the ingredients for story so the story basics are stuff happens people care and there's a moral to the story so there's a who what where and when how does it make people feel why does it matter those are the absolute basic ingredients of a good story and if you can find that you can listen for those ingredients in your own experience or in the experience of people you work with or your customers then you're starting to draw out what you need to tell a story now there are some bonus elements as well which I thought I'd share with you the first bonus story bonus is irony so irony is the difference between what is and what ought to be so to give you an example uh, the founder of match.com uh, lost his girlfriend to a man she met on match.com now that's a lovely irony because he's a boss he should be in control but actually he like everyone else was unlucky in love and the irony is it was his own website he built that lost his girlfriend so that's a lovely irony it's the difference between how things are and how they ought to be and there's a script writer called Blake Schneider who says irony gets my attention every time it's like an itch you have to scratch so I'll give you another example of, an, of a story that has rich irony in it so this guy, uh, Ross, Gelbspan, Ross Gelbspan, was a journalist who covered environmental stories way back in the 1970s and right the way through. And he was at a conference one day um, about overpopulation and, and the, 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 the danger that was posing to the planet. And he noticed that one of the speakers on the platform, one of the experts, a woman called um, Donella Meadows, was actually pregnant. And he said it was a, a beautiful irony because she'd found personal hope in the midst of all this massive doom and gloom. And so that was the irony he found, and he, he shaped the rest of his story around that, that nice irony, the difference between what she was campaigning about and what she was actually doing. Now, of course, there's another part of this story, which is the following day after he printed this story in a, in a national newspaper, uh, he got a phone call saying, uh, Donella's not actually pregnant. Um, she's just a, a bit of a large lady, she's not pregnant. And of course he was absolutely mortified and with embarrassment at having made that terrible mistake. So as well as irony, sometimes you can get a story with a twist and that's their giving audiences something that they weren't expecting. And if you can give people those things, then they will remember the message you're trying to get across. Because I tell you what, if you are wanting to explain to people now why it's important to check your facts before you publish something, then you'll remember the story of Ross and you'll remember how embarrassed he felt when he realized he just said in public that somebody was pregnant who wasn't pregnant. So that will help you remember that story will stay in your mind. So when you need to explain to people, right, we need to fact check before we publish, that's the story that you will remember. So let's just talk a little bit more about stories that you can use in work, because I've been talking about journalists who obviously tell stories for a living. But you can use stories every day in every every place that you work there's a way of using stories um, in fact there's a great book uh, by a guy called Sean Callahan called putting stories to work and he says simply this 
a, a story is simply the retelling of things that happened to illustrate a point. So if you think about your own work experience, there are lots of points that you need to get across to your, your colleagues, uh, to your bosses, to your customers, to the, to the stakeholders, to anyone who you're working with. You need to get a point across to them. And so a story is your best way of doing it. And it's simply retelling things to make a point. So it's remember, it's the stuff happens, people care, here's the point. Now, Sean Callahan, it's a great, great book, and I'll send you the link in, in the, uh, the tweets later. But Sean Callahan says there are lots of different ways you can do this. So you may need to make a point about values, the values of your company. Uh, you may need to make a point about the need for innovation. Uh, you may need to make a point about the lessons you've learned as part of doing something. Also, you might want to talk about the vision that you've got for the future or the, the importance of loyalty. He said there are lots and lots, there are dozens of things that you need to communicate in a business. And each time you identify one of these things, you think about, okay, what's the story I could tell that would help me illustrate that point? Where have I heard someone talking about a story here that will help me prove this point to other people? Because if you just give them a PowerPoint full of opinion and fact, they're just not gonna remember it. If you tell them a story, then they will. And Sean Callahan says that the stories help you in lots of ways. They can help you to make a connection with somebody else. They can help you to find, find clarity about what it is you're actually doing. And the other thing he said as well is about influencing or even debunking. So often there are stories going around that you don't like. There are stories that are going around that you think are damaging to you or to your company. And he said, there's, there's no point trying to, to debunk a story with facts because once people have a story in their heads, they tend to believe it. Um, the best way of debunking a story is with a better story. Um, so there are lots of different types of stories you can use in your work, uh, but they all have those same basic ingredients of stuff happened, people cared, here's why. Um, there are a couple of stories which we can just look at in a little bit more detail before we, um, before we come to the close. Foundation stories and brand stories. So I'm gonna show you two videos now, very short. Uh, they're both TV adverts from, um, well, one's from 1982 and one's from 2012, both for the same brand, but you see the difference. Steve, I don't think the sound is on, or at least we don't. Oh know. gosh, right. Apologies. So, guys, this this is a, a video for uh, Nike, the shoe company, and this first film was made in the nineteen eighties, and it shows the evolution of running. So basically, it shows from caveman to to marathon runner. Uh, this is how humans run, and Nike are basically taking the technology and boosting the tech um, to make it even easier for runners to to run. Uh, so that's, a, that's essentially the, uh, the, the sound for that particular, uh, that's the story of that advert, and it obviously talks about Nike. And then in 2012, they started running this campaign, which again, I'm sorry you won't get the sound, uh, but I'll, I'll narrate it to you. Um, and the sound, basically, what we see on this advert is, as you tell, a, a road in Midwest America somewhere, and a kid running across the hill. Um, and the narrator is talking about the idea of greatness and saying how greatness is just a thing we invented and you don't need to be at the top of your game as, a, as an athlete to be great. You simply need to be hitting your personal best. So greatness, look, greatness looks different in all kinds. For different people, there are different definitions of great. What, they, what they're getting at without saying is for an overweight 15-year-old kid running down the road, he's sweating, he's wobbling, he's not any means a great athlete but for him this is greatness um, and what they're saying is you can find your greatness no matter what kind of athlete you are um, you can find your greatness now what's fascinating about this is they don't even mention the word Nike they don't even mention the fact he's wearing shoes uh, they simply talk about the fact that this is someone finding their own personal best uh, the same with this advert again there's a kid so you get the idea now what we're looking at here are two different types of story a foundation story and a brand story so the foundation story 
is about the company and the brand and the, the, the shoe. So the foundation story was basically, aren't we great? We're scientists. We make these amazing shoes. Look at our shoes. Look at our technology. Here's a man in a white coat. Here's a computer. We're great. We make Nike shoes. The brand story is, here is a customer of ours. And the customer of ours is pushing to find their greatness. And it's all about them. And it's they're on a journey. They are achieving something amazing. By the way, they're using our shoes. So you can see the difference between the two. So to break that down a little bit further, in the foundation story, you are the hero. So when we talk about stuff happens, people care and the moral of the story. In the foundation story, it's about where, how did you get to where you are today? And that could be you personally or you the company. Uh, what were the key moments, triumphs and setbacks in how you got to where you are today? Why does it matter to you? How does it make you and others feel the fact that you've gone on this journey? And the moral of the story is, well, what do you now want us to do or think as a result of this story you've just told us? So that's the foundation story. And that was the story Nike were telling in their first advert, how we got to where we are today. In the brand story, your customer is the hero. So stuff happens, people care, moral of the story. In the stuff happens, what was life like for your customer before and after? So what was life like for that kid when he first, before he even started running? What made him want to go running? How is he going to feel six months time if he keeps running before and after? What are the key moments, the triumphs and the setbacks? Now, what's it like if that kid gets laughed at the first time he goes out in his running shoes? How does that make him feel? How does he keep going? Why does this matter to your customer? You can see the emotion, the emotional content there in terms of that, that kid trying to get fit. How does it make him feel? How does it make you feel? And the moral of the story, again, is what do you want us to think or do as a result? Well, in this case, you want us to buy shoes. So the thing about foundation stories and brand stories, you need to use both, but you actually need to use your foundation story quite sparingly. But I'll give you another example. I was watching a pitch at a business conference and a young entrepreneur uh, was again pitching. He had about a 15 minute window and he spent eight, nine, maybe 10 minutes of that window talking about his journey, his journey to where he, how, where, where he'd got to now, all the different products he tried, and all the different setbacks he'd experienced and the triumphs. And he just talked about himself for the first eight or nine minutes of the pitch. And then he told us about the product he was now making that he wanted us to, to think about investing in. And after two or three minutes, I was just silently screaming, going, just, just get on with it. We get it. You're a hard worker. We get it. You don't need to tell us any more examples of why you're a hard worker. Tell us what you're doing now, because that's what, we, that's what we're here for. So you, you have to be... You do need your foundation story, but you have to use them sparingly. Um, so, for example, you are, if you are pitching, you need to give people enough information about your story that they trust you, but then move on to your customer and how you're going to help them. The other advantage of brand stories, of telling stories where your customer is the hero, is that you can only really tell your foundation story once, whereas you can tell as many customer stories, brand stories, as you have customers. So you can tell a much more varied range of stories if you're talking about your customers rather than yourself. And finally, it feels more generous to talk about other people than it does talk about ourselves. If anyone talks about themselves all the time, we think they're boring. If they talk about other people, we think they're connected. So that's my only note of caution about foundation stories. So final thing I'm gonna say before we open up to questions is, Let's talk about stories you can use in work starting right now. So in other words, you leave today and you bump into someone. At the end of today, you can do this right now. So what I want you to imagine is a, is a networking event uh, or, or a meeting in the canteen or a meeting in the corridor with someone you haven't seen for a while. Um, and the conversation goes something like this. Hey, so what line of work are you in? Or, hey, what are you up to right now? And you'll say, well, I work for a company who... Do whatever it is you do. Insert your business. Oh, yeah. Yeah, so just last week we... And then you put in the story of someone you helped. So this is the, the simplest, simplest, simplest way of introducing stories into how you talk about work. 
So you, you, and also you can track backwards from this. So if you imagine you're going to have that line you say when someone says, oh, so what is it you do? Or what are you up to at the moment? And you need to have it in one pithy sentence what it is you're actually doing right now. Um, and then the second line is the story. So not the first line, you don't start off with a story, you, you tell people what you're doing, because it might be that absolutely they have no interest in what you're doing, in which case they won't ask. But if they've got some interest in it, then you've got a story to back it up. Oh yeah, so last week, uh, for example, I don't say, you don't say to them, right, I'm going to tell you a story. What you say is, oh yeah, just, just last week I helped this, or just last week we did this, or two months ago we were working on this. You start to put down those markers of this is a story, you're going to remember it. So we're going to come up, to, I'm going to ask you four questions. Um, and whilst you're thinking about that, I'm going to put up on the screen the kind of summary of the things we've talked about. So when you want to tell great stories about your work, it's about stuff that's happened, why people care, and what the moral of the story is. And the other thing that we've talked about are foundation stories and brand stories. But of course, there are many, many more stories you can tell about your work. Um, I will tweet out, in fact, I've been auto, hopefully auto tweeting as we've gone. So you'll, I'll send you out the slide deck and the information from this presentation uh, via Twitter. So if you are on Twitter, it's at Steve Rawling and you can pick up some information, information right away and I'll send out more. But that's it for me. So let's have some questions. Thank you very much, Steve. I, I think it was a really I got really lots of ideas how to tell better stories myself um, and I Good. hope that um, I, I think that the attendees did too. So um, for the attendees you can use uh, again the questions box in the, um, in the right hand side uh, to ask the question for Steve. And until somebody does, I have one question, um, okay. and it's related to B2B, because this is something that I do and I like to do, uh, communicate mm -hmm. in uh, B2B environment. So do you maybe know or could suggest a, a really good storytelling case that you like in B2B? Um, so I think the thing is, we talk about business to business, but actually we're really you know, businesses don't sell to businesses, people sell to business, uh, people sell to people. Um, yeah. So human I think human. the thing to, yeah, exactly, it's human to human, it always is, um, until, you know, until the robots take over, it's always gonna be human to human. Um, so I think the, the interesting thing is to think in every single situation like that, um, you are, you're talking about how does one person help another achieve what they want, and it's always either get them more of what they like or let or take away the problems that they've got. Um, so I think they, they, there's lots. I mean, when I'm thinking about uh, my own, for example, my own, how I, how I approach when I'm talking to business clients myself, because I obviously run a business, I sell services to other businesses. Um, and I find myself within probably within 30 seconds of a conversation, I find myself going into examples, going into stories. Uh, so I'll, I'll describe. So if I, we talked about that um, moment ago, we talked about the, um, the, what the structure for a networking chat. So, Hey, what sort of line of work are you in? And I would say, Oh, well, I work for a company who I help people uh, tell great stories about their work. Oh yeah. Yeah. So last week I was at a conference and I met this woman who really, really struggled uh, with, so you see very, very quickly I get into an example. Um, so that's, and, and ultimately all kind of business to business conversations are like that. Um, it's, I think I can help you with whatever it is that you're doing. Um, yeah. and I'm going to give you an example. F focusing on the, on the user, not on ourselves. Focusing on the, but yeah, it's bit, absolutely, well, absolutely. Yes. And it's always, it is always better to tell stories about how you've helped other people than to just tell stories about your own success. Um, exactly. because, you know, first of all, first of all, telling stories about your own success feels like very quickly feels like you're bragging or showing off. Um, mm. And also, if you're telling stories where the, you're helping someone else to achieve something, the person who's listening is thinking, I've got that problem too. I wonder if you could help me. So it's a much better place to be in terms of storytelling is talking about other people. 
Okay, thank you. Uh, we have some questions. So Rachel asks, okay. uh, hi Steve, do you have any oh. off the wall ways for encouraging people to think, to think of and share their own stories that illustrate a company culture? Yes, very interesting one. Um, thank you, Rachel. I was actually at a, at a company two weeks ago and um, they have a UK branch and an American branch and they said the American branch every single morning when the team get together they have something called story share where they have to come up with uh, an example a story they've heard of how their company has helped a client so how their company has helped a customer so everyone is at so what that does is it makes everyone think throughout the day tomorrow morning I'm gonna to have to go into the meeting and tomorrow morning I'm gonna to have to share a story of a client who we've helped so I better start thinking I better be on the lookout for them so your and your antenna are twitching the whole time looking for examples and if you start looking for them you find them or you start having conversations and instead of just just chatting of ordinary stuff you'll say um, you'll say well, tell me tell me tell me a bit more about how that worked then and so you start so that's one great way is to actually build it into part of the the, the company culture and say okay every morning that was interesting the culture the, the the UK company said that they thought about doing it but they thought that was a bit too American and so they hadn't done it um, which I thought was quite interesting but the American guys do it all the time so that's a great one just have a, a story share once a week it's a really simple way to start and the story should be how have we helped somebody okay so we have several questions uh, Michael uh, is asking can you give examples of good storytellers or bad storytellers <laughs> um, there's lots of bad storytellers out there Michael um, I think anyone who uses um, you know long words long sentences who who basically anyone who, well basically if you're the bad storytellers the ones who are just not telling stories they're just giving you their opinions and they're giving you facts um, and I think there's lots of them out there and if they wrap that up in jargon and they wrap it up in kind of you know business language uh, thinking that that will make them sound more serious uh, whew, honestly it's painful I sat through a presentation at a conference uh, two weeks ago and I, I kind of I was so cross by the by the end of it because it is such a terrible waste of my time um, so there's lots of bad storytellers out there. Um, good storytellers. I tell you what, I mean, it's a bit of a cliche, but it, most TED talks that you watch will use a story structure to get their points across. So they have they have coaches who work with all the presenters. Um, so if you watch a TED talk, um, you can almost break it down and say, okay, this is the, this is the beginning, middle, and end bit of the story. This is the before and after bit of the story. This is the um, the sudden sudden realization bit of the story. So you can kind of watch almost any TED talk, um, and you'll find that they've been very well coached in how to turn complicated information into a story. There's also uh, TED talks on TED talks, like uh, Nancy Duarte. There are TED talks on TED. <laughs> yes, absolutely right. And there's also a very good book. There's a very good book which I'll send around a link for um, on the the anatomy of a TED talk. Uh, and how to how to copy it. Okay, thank you. So uh, Andrew uh, is asking, what are your thoughts on the hero's journey as a framework for business storytelling? Well, that's an interesting, Andrew. Up until about eleven o'clock this morning, I was going to include a piece on the hero's journey, um, but I decided not to put it in because I thought there was I was overloading the presentation. Um, I do use that as part of my um, toolkit. Um, I think it is. Fantastic! Um, it it works because um, because that's the way we tell stories, and those are the kind of stories we, we remember. Um, I think the the trick, if you if you're familiar with it, um, if you're familiar with the hero story, the hero's journey, it's a sort of like a story arc. Um, if you're not familiar with it, just think beginning, middle, and end. Um, and the beginning is where the hero is in a very dull place, very frustrated. The middle is where the adventure starts, and the end is the you know the end of the adventure. Uh, if you're familiar with it, then it's great. Um, the trick I think is to to see that as a useful. You don't have to follow every single beat of the story, um, but see it as a useful template, and to use what bits you can and don't use what which bits you can't. But I think most importantly is you can use it for multiple 
So you can use it if you want to tell the story of your company, your brand. Um, so your company has done this, and, or I as the founder of the company, or my personal journey. So you can use it for a personal journey, but it's actually much more useful to tell it where you're not the hero, the customer is the hero, and what you're doing is you're coming in and helping the hero on the journey. Um, so you are not the Hobbit, you're Gandalf, you're not Luke Skywalker, you're Yoda, uh, you're not the hero, you're the mentor. Um, so that's a much more useful way of approaching that hero's journey idea. Um, and I think, just don't get carried away with it, stories can be really simple. Um, so stories can simply be, stuff happened, it made people think or feel this, and as a result we're going to do this differently. So it can be as simple as that. You can, over, you can overthink it. Thank you. Um, Lindsay is asking, sometimes people just want to get the concept, they don't want to be stalled with an often long-winded story. When is the best moment to tell stories? Okay, um, not when people are under pressure, obviously. So if people say, I need this information right now, that is not the time to start telling them a story. Absolutely right. Um, it is, it, it, you'll, you'll, the best time you'll, you'll get a feel for it when you try it. So I think if you see people, you're talking to people and you're trying, you start a story and they get visibly impatient, then clearly that's not the right time to be telling a story. Um, or if they say things like cut to the chase, just give me the facts, then clearly they're not interested in, this, in the story. If you're, if you're being given time, so people are going to, they've said, right, I'm going to sit back and listen to what you have to say. So it's in a, it's in a meeting, it's a presentation, it's a pitch, or it's a, an article you're writing uh, for, a, for a website or social media, then you, you have a little bit of time. And all you need is to, to give people a little sense that something is going to happen. Now, you don't need to say, I'm going to tell you a story, um, but you need to give a hint that something is going to change from the beginning to the middle to the end, something's going to change in the way, and someone's, someone's going to learn something. And that, we kind, we kind of get intrigued by that. But clearly, if someone's under, under time pressure, and they just need some information really quickly, don't tell them a story, just give them the information. Okay, thanks. Um, well, we don't have a name, it just says HTML5 viewer uh, user. Uh, says, hi okay. Steve. Um, Thanks for the ideas and inspiration in this session. Uh, what's your advice for crafting stories where there has been difficulties along the way, relentlessly positive or honest? Uh, relentlessly positive is not good. Um, I, there's, um, there's something very interesting about, um, and this is where story arcs come in as well, about stories as kind of a roller coaster. Um, so if you're thinking, well, you want people to go from, you want the person in the story to change. They need to go from one position to another position where they're slightly better off or, or much better off. Um, if they just go in a straight line, you know, it, it's actually quite boring. If all you get is this kind of steady, steady march towards the, the end goal and nothing ever goes wrong, it's boring, frankly, um, and people start to get bored with it. So the roller coaster in the story um, is where stuff does go wrong um, and you bounce back from it. And so the, the, a lot of the, what the story arc talks about is the lowest point in a character's journey, in someone's journey. So if you're thinking about it in, in, in business terms, the, you, you might think about, well, there are times where I tried something and it failed. So what do I do about that? Do I just pretend it didn't happen? Or do I tell people I tried something, I had big high hopes for it, and it failed, and I felt terrible, and this is what I've learned from it, and this is what we're doing differently now. So you're giving people the, oh, I had high hopes, it failed, this is what we're doing now that's different. So you're trying to give people that roller coaster ride, and they like, they like it, they like it. They like it. It's like a cliffhanger or a, any kind of well-structured story has moments of highs and lows. And in fact, there's, a, there's an argument in the script writing world that you need to give people a, a sort of high and then a low, and then a high and then a low, and then a high and then a low, and if you give them it in those kind of, you know, good news, bad news, good news, bad news, good news, bad news, alternation, it, it hooks them in. They actually become addicted to the story. They can't put it down. If you think about every good, the last time you picked up a great um, novel and just couldn't put it down, 
uh, or the last the, there's a DVD somewhere at home that you've watched five times, ten times, and you just love watching it over and over again, it will typically be a story with lots of ups and lots of downs. So by, by do not think for a moment that you only have to tell positive stories. Nor interestingly, um, no, one's asked, no one's asked about happy endings. Um, you don't always have a happy ending in a story. Uh, so you might be working with someone who was wanting to get somewhere, wanting to achieve something, and, and it hasn't worked yet. But the key word there is yet. So if you can't give somebody a happy ending, all you need to do is hold out the hope of a happy ending. So they haven't got there yet, but they're still trying. And that's what we like. We like people who, who try. Yeah, good point. One of my favorite things is that uh, if uh, it's not, uh, if something bad happens, you know, if it's not, uh, uh, oh, I forgot about it now. So uh, if it's not okay, it's not over yet, something like that. Yeah. Uh, maybe I have the microphobia because I forgot my favorite thing right now. Um, so <laughs> Lara is asking, um, do you think the same principles of storytelling apply when it comes to delivering bad or negative news? Oh gosh, that's a good question. Um, I think, again, it's, it's back to the point that Lindsay was making earlier, I think, that, uh, that sometimes people just want you to get to the point um, and they don't want you to go into a long-winded story. Uh, so I think you need to be very sensitive to who you're talking to and it may be that that's not the time to tell a story. You just simply need to get straight to the point um, and explain what the bad news is rather than trying to... any. If people, are, if people are expecting bad news or the, it's unexpected bad news, they don't want it to be sugar-coated or to, they just want to know what the news is so they can then deal with it, I think. Um, I think it, it then comes, comes back to, if you're talking about working in, in a company environment, um, then it's part of the, well, actually, does your company have a, a, a broader story um, that explains what it does and why? So if your company has, so the company I worked for, for over 20 years was the, the BBC um, and it was a public funded organization with a mission to inform, educate and entertain. Um, and so everyone kind of knew its mission. That was its, its big story. Um, and you, if you had to explain why something was happening that was bad, you would say, well, actually this is because this is public money. We can't afford to do this with public money. Um, this is not part of our core mission. So it, it, it helped to have a well understood big story because you could then relate the bad news to that. Um, but I don't think you'd want to then start off breaking, you wouldn't want to go into a meeting and break bad news to people by telling them a story first and then telling them the, the bad news at the end. I think you just need to be just straight with people and tell them what the bad news is. Um, it may be that when you then try to put it into context of why, are, why has this happened, that's part of the wider story of the, the place you work for. Well, what about uh, the sandwich method? You know, the good part, the bad part, and then the good part. You see, in a little way, that's a little bit like the roller coaster I talked about, about before. Um, I think it can be a bit overused. It depends whether you're talking about sort of, you know, are you talking about a series of facts? Here's a good fact, a bad fact, a good fact, or are you talking about a kind of, you know, a, a progression of a journey of, you know, someone or somebody. Ex experiencing something as as we do as a hero in a story um so yeah i mean that that uh it's not it's not something that i've ever ever used i think you just need to give people bad news quite you know clear, quickly clearly and and then actually the the main thing then is to shut up and listen uh to what they they have to say listening is probably an important part of storytelling would you agree? without a doubt I would agree. So when we think back to the, the slides we uh, looked at earlier, um, all the things about, you know, those kind of, those, there are things people say that indicate they're telling the story. So they talk about time and place and people and, and they talk about action and they talk about um, emotion. So when they're talking about those things, they're indicating that they're telling us, <coughs> excuse me, that they're telling a story. So those, those are the things you need to listen for are the, the, you know, the who, what, where and when of a story the how it makes people feel and, and the why it matters. Uh, so yes, listening is a really key skill, which is why going back to that example of the American company, um, you know, it's really interesting that they built into their working, their working day, we're going to share stories of 
how we've helped our customers. So actually everyone knows they need to be listening out the whole time for the story they can tell. Okay, and we have, I think, one last question uh, from okay. Cynthia. Uh, how can mm -hmm. companies repackage their stories to create a culture of storytelling for external news? Well, that's interesting. Um, you see, there's, there's, uh, the stories you tell within a company are, are quite interesting. I think nowadays, with, with the way social media is, you have to assume any story that's told within a company is quite likely to, to escape and be known by the wider world uh, it's very difficult uh, unless you work for the CIA or, or someone like that it's very difficult to think that um, you can keep stories secret um, <clears throat> excuse me so I think there are, there are kind of there are, there are two things I suppose um, one is around that kind of the bigger strategic s story of why does our company work do the things we do um, which is a story you just you know you need to you need to tell, but you can't just tell the same story over and over and over again. You need to actually find different examples that illustrate. So remember back to Sean Callahan's point, it's retelling some information in order to illustrate a point. So you know what your big, your mission is, but you need to, you can't just give it as a mission statement. You need to keep finding examples that, that prove it. And if you're doing what you said, you're you met, you know, if you're doing what you want to do or doing what you said your company should be doing, you should be finding lots of examples all the time of stories you can tell. Um, and then the other thing is about, is about encouraging people to, um, to share stories that, that they've picked up that matter to them and pass them up. So, you know, is there a way of, of people, the stories that people are telling in different parts of the organization to reach other people? So if one part of the organization is, is doing something in a really new way, is there any way of that story reaching other parts of the organization? Um, so depending on the size of the organization you're talking about, I know that there are some big organizations which organize internal communications departments um, whose job is to, you know, to spread stories. Um, and a lot, but a lot, of, a lot of companies now look at who in their organization is very, very connected so who has a, a, a very connected network within the organization? Um, and they rely on that kind of thing instead, more informal networks. Um, but essentially, you're talking about the same thing. You're talking about, about stories which, um, you know, where, where practical stuff has happened uh, that involve people that have emotional impact and that prove a point, that make a, you know, that have a moral to the story. And if you have those, then they will kind of almost share not by themselves, but they'll be very easy to share. Mm -hmm. Well, um, I think we ran out of time now. Thank you very much for your uh, inspirational presentation. I'm sure that uh, everybody loved it since uh, almost everybody's still here. Uh, okay. You will all <laughs> get, yeah, uh, you will all get the recording uh, tomorrow so we can share it with uh, other colleagues, I'm sure. Uh, you'll do that, and in one month's time, uh, approximately in mid-May, uh, you can expect uh, another webinar, but we won't uh, give out the topic just yet. So, uh, Steve, thank you very much for your inspirational talk. Thank, thank you, Yasmin. Thank you, thank you, and thank you for hosting. Just that last point, if people want to ask any more questions, just get me on Twitter, and, um, you know, I'll, I'll come back to you as quick as I can. Yes, but thanks for Steve hosting Rowling, who's been tweeting, although he's been with us because of uh, the use of technology. The marvels of the internet, yeah, that's right. Yes. <laughs> Thank you very much and everybody have a good day. Bye. Thank you.